All right. Uh, welcome back, folks, for our next installment of the Honors Program Colloquium Series here at Texas A&M University Texarkana. I'm very happy to be introducing a colloquium today that is being uh, presented by one of our Honors Program students, uh, Anil Pignori, who's on my screen to my left, I suppose. Uh, Anil's a junior biology major. And uh, the the colloquium project that she's presenting today is actually one that she did under the mentorship of Dr. Tom Morrissey uh, in an art appreciation course or coming out of that course. So a little bit outside her field, uh, but it should be very exciting. And the program is entitled If 2020 Were a Painting. So we're going to let uh, Anil and Tom essentially talk about the project, and then we should have some time for questions uh, later on. So yeah, take it away, folks. Okay, let me share my screen. <laughs> Oops, can everyone see it? Okay, so I'm Anil and I decided to do my project about 2020. Now I know a lot of stuff happened in 2020 and I could not put everything on a single piece of paper. So I chose to do COVID-19. Now I know we're all tired of that word. I'm not gonna go over what Corona was like, don't worry about that. Uh, I really wanted to do this project to, you know, show how much I appreciate the frontline workers and all the stuff they did, you know, they had to go to work every single day with strength, because like if my doctor comes in and they're like stressed, I would be stressed too, so you know, they had to show courage and, you know, just put on a smile, okay, so now I had Dr. Moore say back in art appreciation and I showed him some of my works from AP art back in high school. And he mentioned that they kind of reminded him of Frida Kahlo's. So that's where we started to kind of put the project together. And before I show you my project, I'm gonna talk about Frida Kahlo because as I was researching her, I realized we have so much in common and it was really worth me. If you don't know who Frida Kahlo is, she was a Mexican painter. She was self-taught, same as me. We both taught ourselves how to you know, draw the face and everything. And she had about 200 paintings, which is not as much as you would think. And that's because a lot of stuff that happened throughout her life, which we will definitely talk about. Now her paintings included still lifes, portraits of herself, her family and friends. Still life is like when you have a bunch of objects or even one in front of you and, draw it, and you draw it from life. She also had illustrated journals. Now, Frida was really interested in medicine. She wanted to go to medical school, same as me, that's my major, but she got into this bus accident where she fractured her collarbone, ribs, she had like 11 fractures in her leg, and she was immobile for three months. I hope that does not happen to me, that is, <laughs> you know, since we have everything in common. So yes, during those three months, she made some of her best works. And for her time, she was really controversial, if that's even the right word. She had affairs with both male and females. And so for her creative processes, we can divide those in four different steps. So like the things that help her put her thoughts and messages on in her paintings. The first one being inspiration. She was definitely influenced by her indigenous Mexican culture. You know, she was ne never too afraid to show her culture and she was so proud of it. And in her paintings, she would usually like wear bright clothes and she had this pre-Columbian beads she would always include in that. Outside, she would wear pink boots, stylish sunglasses and like embroidered dresses. She was so proud of her like Aztec heritage. She showed it as a national pride. That's like, that was the expression for it, which is the same for me. I'm not from here, I'm Persian. So I'm always so happy to show other people my culture. Now, before she became famous as an artist before she work her father played an important role in her life he was from germany and he migrated to mexico he was also a professional photographer so he taught her how to retouch the photos and she used that when she was doing self-portraits and she loves doing self-portraits like one of the um quotes she used was that i paint myself because i am the i'm 
often alone and I'm the best subject I know. Now, this is one of the differences we have. I do not like drawing self-portraits because when you're drawing someone, you have to look at all the details and I see myself every day. So there's all these flaws, you know, that's one differences we have. And then her mother was also another important role in her life. She was a strict Catholic. She took her to church every day. And that's where she got, you know, she gained knowledge and inspired by Christianity. She often employed religious motives in her painting. Now, when it comes to personal experience, she went through a lot in her life. She had a miscarriage. Her marriage was not good. She ended up having a divorce and the operation she went through after her accident. So she used those um things that she went through to put on in her paintings and you know that i feel the same way if i'm like going through something i put them in my paintings because you know that's like a comfort for me curiosity she was such a curious girl she was interested in politics philosophy literature mythology anatomy biology same with me i love anatomy and biology and she often you know put them in her paintings as like a theme or like a motive and when it come, came to politics, she was very active. She was also like part of this communist party of Mexico. So if she wanted to convey a message about politics, she would also include stuff in her drawings. Now, I showed the picture that's on here after each slide. So here, like I talked about the bright clothes she had on, and then we will talk about the moon later because they symbolize something. Now collections. So a lot of artists have ateliers. It's like a place they go to, or like this, my desk is my atelier, is where I do my drawings. Is like a comfort zone where you get, you know, really comfortable with the collections that you have, where you get in the zone to, you know, do your drawings. And for her, it was Casa Azul, which is the blue house. And this was in her garden. She was born there and she also died there. So, you know, it was a pretty important place. The collections that she had were just like, you know, watercolors, her painting tools, she had a wheelchair that she used after her operation, and she also had exotic pets, so she had monkeys, dogs, birds, and fawn, and these she included in her drawings, which they symbolize something. Now, the Mexican culture, the monkey, it kind of symbolized lust, but she would reverse the meaning of them. She would make it original symbolism out of it, which I really like because when artists have like original meanings, that's just something I really like, you know, cause you came up with it yourself. And this is one of the paintings where she included her monkey. I just think it's so cute. <laughs> I don't have a pet to include in my drawing. So another difference. Now symbolism. So for symbolism, there were different categories. She used to convey messages. When it came to um, colors, she used green to like show good warm light, yellow would be madness, sickness, even joy, navy blue would be distance, tenderness. Now for other objects, she used a heart, which this would show the intensity of her pain. You know, she once again flipped the meaning of this. And I'm pretty sure in the Aztec hair sedge, it was a ritual sacrifice. I also used to draw hard a lot in my drawings back in high school. That was not because it didn't have that special meaning. I just want to be a cardiovascular surgeon. So that's really important to me. She also, as I said, was into mythology and Eastern religion. So she would use yin yang symbols and the third eye motive a lot. Now the hummingbird and the Mexican culture, it's like a talisman. It brings luck and love. Once again, she flipped that and she showed her loss through love. Now, when it came to other objects, she would like go to her garden. She would pick out different fruits to show in her drawings or she would go to the local market. Now for politics, she was really interested in them. So she would use flags and the peace stuff to convey any messages she want. Like in that first picture I showed you, she had the American flag. For analysis, another quote I like from hers is that she said, I paint my own reality. So anything that happened around her, the people around her, they were all included in the drawing. That's sometimes what the drawing was about. And one of the main techniques she used is dualism binary opposition. So it would be sun and moon, like that first drawing, yin yang, divine and mortal. And one of her um, famous paintings she used this on was this, which is the two Fridas. She did this after she divorced from Rivera. So on the left, you got 
the um, Frida that her ex-husband loved and then on the my bad, on the right and then on the left is the one that was rejected and you can see she included the heart which is like cut in half and then there's blood dripping but on the right is like perfectly fine however they're like connected by an artery they're holding hands during this together you know now interactions a lot of people said that if she didn't interact and communicate with the people around her she wouldn't have been such a great artist as she was so there were a lot of people like she had a lot of lovers i'm not going to include those they were not as important as the people i have on here so the first one was her father as we talked about and then diego was the person she divorced from you know he helped her move from to New York and California. He did, he was also an artist. He did many murals, but he also, you know, they also did a lot of drawings together. So he was pretty important, but he then made her go through a lot of pain, which she included in her paintings. And then Alejandro was her classmate for three years. They fell in love, but they got into an accident together. But here's where it gets romantic. He <laughs> So during the accident, he basically told the doctor, he was like, hey, she's in like so much pain, you need to help her. And so of course the doctors helped her. And if, you know, if it wasn't for him, she wouldn't have survived that accident. And then Lev Trotsky, he was an active communist. He was her red lover. And then Dr. Leo was the doctor that did the operation on her after her surgery. So she said that, you know, he felt her emotional and physical, anything that she went through, he knew what she was going through to the point where she dedicated painting for him. So this is what she did for him. Okay, now enough about Frida. <laughs> okay, so this is the painting that I was inspired by. And so this is her work. This is the one I did. I use, I mainly use um, different mediums. So most people would like only focus on acrylic or watercolor. There were some stuff like I could not watercolor. So I put everything together on a piece of paper where you would, this is, would be called mixed media. Yes, so as I said, I wanted to show my appreciation to frontline workers. And I included Panthers in the back because they represent strength. And that's what the frontline workers, nurses and doctors went through for the past hey, year. Tell me what's going on. For what? Okay, so the color scheme I did was this. And Frida used many analogous colors. So like if you would look at the color wheel, they would be right next to each other. But me and Dr. Morrissey, we thought that it'd be better if we added complementary colors. So, oops, sorry. So we added maroon on the stethoscope, a little bit in the leaves and then my eyes because, you know, it would balance it out. Now for the sketches, the first sketch I did, I thought it would be better if we added one panther. As you see, I was very confused what the leaves are called. I still don't know what they're called. <laughs> but Dr. Morrissey mentioned that it was too weighted on the left. So like when you start looking at the drawing, your eyes would go straight to the panther and then it would go through me, which the person is the focal point here. So we changed that to two panthers because now when you look at it, your eyes go in between the panthers and then it goes through the other parts. That's all I wanted to say. Now, if Dr. Morrissey has anything to add to that. That was an excellent presentation. To, um, can, can we go off of the screen sharing, I guess? Although uh, everybody knows what I look like, so. And then I hope that other people would have questions for you too. Um, but working together was really exciting because we did uh, discuss uh, the various color palettes and how uh, colors interact and the compositional things. And, she, and that was, I was really pleased that she worked through all the sketches. And I'm, I'm especially pleased that, that she included that in the presentation because so many people just show you the finished piece and they don't show you the process. And then you walk away think, thinking, boy, these people are such geniuses. How did they do that? And you don't realize that they had to go through steps to get there. But I wanna plug 
the art program and I want to plug the art appreciation class. And um, one of the things I talk about in art appreciation is that, well, I don't have a specific order to enter this into, but I'd like to say that arts is a strange bedfellow when it comes to higher education. And the reason why I say that is because people don't study accounting or physics or uh, any much anything else in school with the idea that they're they're gonna that they enjoy it. They're gonna putz around with it on the weekends and after work, you know. And so that's that's the problem that we have with art is that people. When I started thinking I was gonna major in art, I've been a, a pilot, you know, and uh, to major in art, people go what? <laughs> you know? um, but um, so I I wanted one of the things I stress in the class is how do you what about art with a capital A as far as the art with a lowercase a. And so according to a 2019 Bloomberg article, uh, the arts in the United States are bigger to our economy than the economic output of Sweden and Switzerland. And that the arts contribute more than 800 billion a year, which is about 4% of our GDP. So right away the arts, you know, like people don't think of it that way. But how do you take, how do you get your art from little a art to big a art, and how do you get it into the network? And so some of the things that they don't talk about in the art appreciation books, and I'm trying to develop modules now that I can, I can maybe hopefully market. But um, you know, her career, of course, we mentioned uh, Rivera. Uh, you know, while she was in his shadow, we all, all would know uh, he he got her here and uh, he was painting big murals and so as a result they were she was able to meet a lot of influential people and uh she met among them was uh, andre Breton, who was a surrealist painter and he made arrangements for her to get her first show at the museum of modern art in 1938 so uh how again how do you make your they're, they're, the world is full of people who are just happy to, to make paintings but if you read about the lives of artists, as with Frida, you'll discover that their that their lives are full of uh, turmoil and uh, you know uh, demons, so to speak. And uh, so people, artists, don't really major in art to be happy. <laughs> the bottom line. Um, and then after that, uh, she made her first significant sales in 1938. Um, and Edward G. Robinson bought four of her paintings for $200 a piece. And uh, in 2006, a painting that she did in 1943, sold an auction for uh, uh, 5.6 million, and then another painting uh, that uh, sold for 8 million. So, you know, uh, so you, you look at that and you think, well, how does that work? Because there was recently a big article that I read about Forge forgeries of Frida's paintings and people discovering that they were forgeries and that the you know the value bottomed out. That's why I have my students watch two films. One called The Price of Everything, and the other one I try to get them to watch, but I can't actually put it up because of uh, you know the copyright things. But it's called Even My Kid Could Paint That, and uh, both of these films kind of address that that point that, uh, you know, how do you assign value? It's like a baseball card, so to speak. Um, and um, so these fake Fridas could actually have been better paintings, really, <laughs> you know, uh, but they're, they, they aren't hers. So how, how do you, uh, how do you re reconcile all that together? So, you know, in closing, I just want to mention that that's part of what I try to get across to the students in the class is above, uh, beyond just the idea of the you know the, the the painting or the sculpture or whatever it is itself, but how 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 is it how does it become the commodity that it is that become that gets your work uh, beyond something that you do uh, uh, and, and into the eight hundred billion dollar a year uh, economy. So with that, I'll shut up. But I'm just really happy to have uh, had this occur, and I'm, I'm really pleased that I was approached to to work together on this project. So I'll shut up. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Doug, you have your hand up. Um, so we'll come back to you in about 20 minutes. Uh, no, I kid because I love. Please lead, lead us off. Lead us off. Now, would you mind putting the, the, mm. the, your work back up on the shared screen for a moment? 
for, forever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, bring it back. Either your choice, sometime between um, a moment and forever. Um, as I say, the uh, I'm always uh, absolutely impressed with the the work that you do. Um, a mere biologist um, manages to do really important, <laughs> cool things, um, or one who aspires to be a mere biologist. Uh, I'm, I'm always ridiculously impressed, and, and I'm not in any way, shape, or form a Frido Kahlo expert um, or an art historian or any of those things. But I think I, I can see the same kind of resonances and, and the sense of it. Um, and, but uh, the question I have for you is: Did you consider uh, and I don't know how to describe it. I guess the 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 gesture of the the painting that you have of the two Fridas and the heart and all of those kind of things. She, she has a tendency to move towards um, more graphic. Um, I would, as a lack of a better term, sort of an ignorance. Um, we'll call them. Did you have an impulse to include um, some of that in the 2021 idea, or to sort of borrow from Kalo more in that regard, or did you make a conscious choice not to do so? Honestly, I didn't even think about that part because <laughs> this was literally in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> so this took like, I don't know, four months just to complete. I did want to like, we wanted to add flowers to the stethoscope. There was like other stuff we wanted to do, but I felt like my main focus would have been the person itself. Mm -hmm. That's why, but if I had to go back, I would definitely like change the way I did these because I feel like I would have done it better right now. <laughs> I don't know. I just have that feeling but yeah no I, I think it's fantastic I, and I, it was just an interesting sort of moment to me because my reflection on the pandemic would have um hearts ripped out and destroyed and the sort of violence of the 2021 um and here i you know it's beautiful and it's a a, a suggestion of strength and and it fits it fit and it fits your personality um as much of it that i know uh, and and so I, I don't necessarily think that you that it needs to have all the the awful in it that that my eye likes to gravitate towards. Um, I think it, I think it's beautiful. But I wondered if you, there was a, a sense of making that choice um, in an effort to project the idea of because ultimately for me, twenty twenty one is a is a dumpster fire. I would I would draw a dumpster and um, light Craig on fire and throw him in it. Um, and you've produced something that is beautiful and strong and powerful um, and representative. I, you just see a, a nicer world than I do, I, and I very much appreciate. It. I probably need. I did that a lot back. In in high school so I'm pretty tired of it <laughs> because my teacher she was like it needs to be sad because it's going to grab people's attention so every day we would go in class I had to think about sad stuff and I was like I'm over this but you know it was fun it was you know part of life hmm. uh, <clears throat> I'll ask a question then I'll, I'll certainly invite questions from the audience as well uh, how would we I guess how would you conceptualize uh, bringing your your biology and your desire to go into medicine and whatnot alongside this passion for art I mean is this going to be um, sort of a a continuing process for you of, of, of essentially expressing those passions you have for for biology and medicine and such through art, you know, essentially, when, when will we see the next one? Um, <laughs> We've already seen the first so... one. Let's move on to the next. All right. <laughs> Just curious. Well, I, I might do one that. for anatomy, for anatomy, because anytime I was like trying to memorize labeling and stuff, I would draw the body myself. That helped me both with art and anatomy at the same time. So like, what muscle is this? What skeleton is this? What part of heart is this? You know, it just, cause drawing and like writing stuff, it gets in your mind faster than anything else. At least for me, that's how, you know, it has to be visual for me. So I might do one for anatomy. I'll be back. Okay, yeah, amen. Um, all right, other, other questions. Who else wants to, wants to jump? Yeah, when are the prints coming out? Yeah, good uh, point. I have I have a quick I have a quick comment I want to share with uh, An Anil. Is that how you say your name? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, one of the volunteer things I do is work with the um, um, a national organization for radiologists, and one of their big initiatives is patient and family centered care and whatnot. But one of the big things that's going on in the medical community that also has impacted education is the notion of burnout. You know, you give, you give, you give, you give, and then you just have nothing left. And so there's also running alongside that, this big push to bring art in, you know, drawing, painting, music, uh, all the things that are gonna replenish and feed your soul 
to get you through this very stressful occupation. So I want to encourage you, you know, as you keep moving, uh, make sure that um, you keep this alive and, and you use it. I think I heard you say, you know, when, when things happen or something, this is one of the ways you may be let out some of your feelings. So bravo to you and keep that up because there is a national group out there waiting for you to get there and continue to contribute. Thank you so much. That's a great point. Um, <clears throat> do we have other questions before, or I ask more? Because <laughs> I will. If you do have a question, you're welcome to unmute if you can. Uh, put it in the chat. Um, you could raise your hand, your Zoom hand, I suppose, as, as Dr. Julian did in the very beginning. Hi, so I don't have a question, but I have a comment. So I'm a biology major too. This is my first year in uh, Texarkana, but I am a sophomore. And honestly, I was like really inspired by your painting. So congrats. It was really good. Thank and honestly, you. I would have never like actually like thought about Frida Kahlo in like that sort of, sort of way, but yeah, good job. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, well, I'll just well, say that, that starting with this painting, because uh, Doug brought up several questions, and I'd say a couple things. One is that's why artists often work in series, because one piece leads to another piece. And uh, I think that Frida, since her paintings were so autobiographical, and this painting is so autobiographical, I thought that I think that her choice in, in, in working um, in this uh, style i think was really appropriate and really work was very successful absolutely uh dr julian you have your hand up you're very civilized well i try am i you I know like, i appreciate it tries, brings it out in me she's much more civilized than i am i've, I've experienced her in the classroom and, and it's sort of like doug just just calm down um i think the the question i have and it's the two I, I wonder which was the easiest piece to do of this and which was the most difficult for you? Because I think I'm always wrong about sort of thinking about what's easy and what's hard. What was the easiest part of doing it? I guess what was also the most difficult? The difficult part were the, like in the painting? Itself? Yeah, the actual painting of it, right? And it, was so sort of it would be the Panthers because I had to go and you know how like the lead pencils, I would like take the lead out and I had to like make marks on the paper so it looked like there were hairs on there and that took a long time. And then I would have to go back in with graphite and then try to shade it, which, you know, of course there was like lines in there so it wouldn't go in. So that would be the hardest part and the easiest, I guess, were the leaves because you know, they just needed shading. <laughs> Technique is, I think, interesting um, in trying to think about that idea and then sort of how, how one arrives at it, thanks. Yeah, I guess I had a question sort of following on what uh, what Kathy was talking about in terms of, um, you know, burnout and such like. Um, how did essentially doing this project um, intersect with how you were dealing with with what was going on in 2020 in general, <laughs> I suppose? I mean, was this, you know, was this therapeutic? Was this um, evocative in some fashion? You know, how, how did it fit into your overall kind of dealing with with the ridiculousness of last year? So being a biology major is like hours of studying and everything. And I did not have time to do paintings aside, you know, cause sometimes I can't force paintings because they're not gonna come the way I want them to. So this was kind of like, hey, there's something you need to do. You have to make time for this. So it was like a getaway for me. I would like put my studying aside. I would make time for it. And, you know, it was like, I would listen to podcasts serial killer podcast by the way that if you're trying to do paintings and listen to a podcast do serial killers that makes you go through this faster than anything else so you know it really helped me get away from like studying and everything and it just brought me back to like high school days because you know the last time I painted something was back in high school I did not have time so this gave me a reason to make time for drawing and painting Okay, excellent, thank you. Uh, there is a comment in the chat that I'll read. 
uh, from uh, Ariel Hopkins, who's currently uh, working at the soccer tournament. I just wanted to say that your painting was so inspiring. You did such a great job highlighting the strength we showed in society during such a difficult time. Proud of my lab partner. So thank you. She's such a great lab partner. Okay. There you go. Excellent. Um, any other questions or comments or or thoughts from uh, from anyone else? I'll give folks a couple seconds to think about that. I think you make a great point about you were put into a situation where you were forced to make time for this. And I want to encourage you to create a place in your calendar to force That's yourself to make time for this. I will. Thank you. <laughs> any, any, anything else from, uh, from either Tom or, uh, or you, Anil? You wanted to add? No, I'm just so glad I got to do this. As I said before we started the meeting, I never had a chance to do a painting because I wanted to do my honors projects as paintings. And I had the chance to do this with Dr. Morrissey. And, you know, we connected a lot because he knew about art and he also knew about the information that we used, the content that we used. So, you know, I really enjoyed this. Excellent. Yeah, not, not to plug the program too much, of course, but in a lot of ways, that is, you know, one of the, I guess, one of the purposes of the honors project uh, as part of the honors program, right, to get uh, motivated, interested students under the, the mentorship of motivated, interested faculty and be able to produce these, um, you know, these really cool, you know, these really cool things. Um, and, I, and I think it's really important in, in many ways, uh, you know, as a biology student, um, to want to do a project in a field that we don't necessarily immediately think of as biology. Um, you know, this is something I talk to honor students a lot about, you know, do I have to do my projects in my major? Uh, no, <laughs> no, you don't. Most people generally do, but, uh, but, you know, finding these kind of connections um, between science and the arts and, and such, I think is, is, is something that's really cool. And uh, bravo to you for, for doing it. And bravo to Tom for, for mentoring it. So I, I appreciate it. Well, they, they still use a lot of Leonardo's drawings and anatomy books. So there is probably a, a, mm -hmm. an opening there to do some new. So never forget to tie your mm -hmm. major together with your not major topics. Because sometimes that's the thing that gets you over the hump in a job interview or something that, that you have uh, that other talent, that other skill, you know, that's outside of the normal, you know, bunch of stuff <laughs> to sound technical that's a great point to tie into your medical school interview because being able to set yourself apart from all the other folks that all made a's and all scored highly you know showing your humanity is is a big plus hmm. that's a great point okay any any final any final thoughts or any last questions or anything no, thanks for doing the program and thanks for letting us participate. I'll tell you that. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, in that case, let's go ahead and, and uh, give thanks to uh, <laughs> to our two presenters, um, Anil and and Tom. So you can you can make the little symbol on your Zoom if you want, or you can applaud normally, uh, or what have you. And uh, I will go ahead and post this on the Honors Program YouTube channel. Sorry, my phone was ringing. Uh, so I will put the, the link out on the, uh, I think it's on the website, actually. So you can, you can go to our website, and if you've missed any of this program, uh, you are welcome to go watch it at your leisure. Uh, Lindsay did point out in the chat that our next Honors Colloquium is going to be next Tuesday. Dr. Murdoch and Dr. Mullins are going to be presenting Autism, What Is It and What Should You Know? So that'll be, again, from noon to whenever we finish, but it'll be before one because I have to go to class. So, um, but yeah, it'll start at noon. It'll continue however long we want to talk, um, at least within an hour. But thank you again, everybody, for uh, for joining us. And uh, we'll see you, uh, see you next time. Yeah, thanks.